Hi everyone, it's been a year now since we started the Regrow Milkweed for Monarchs project and we'd like to share some updates and results with you. First, we'd like to say thank you to Liz Doria, our lab manager who coordinated the Regrow website and interacted with many of you. Liz is moving on to new professional opportunities out of state. Um, unfortunately, this also means that without Liz, we are not planning to repeat the Regrow experiment this year. Stay tuned though, as we might bring it back online in 2022. So let's start out with a little bit of background and context. Our research group at MSU found in past studies that when common milkweed stems are cut back during the summer, they grow new stems a few weeks later and that monarch butterflies lay more eggs on these new stems. Uh, we also found that these stems had fewer predatory insects and spiders on them than the older stems, which could give monarch eggs and caterpillars a better chance at survival, since in normal circumstances around 80% of the eggs and young larvae are usually eaten by other insects and by spiders. And we found that just hatched caterpillars were indeed more than twice as likely to survive their first few days of life on regrown milkweed stems versus the uncut controls. So these results were very exciting and they made us wonder if disturbance, i.e. cutting back milkweed stems, could be used strategically to help improve monarch butterfly habitat. However, there were still lots of unanswered questions. Um, our experiments took place in one type of habitat, old fields, in one part of the monarch range, southern Michigan, and we used just one type of tool to cut back vegetation, uh, trimmers with brush blades attached. So that's where you all come in. We decided to design a follow-up experiment to test if our results held true in other settings, if we use other tools, uh, and try it in different locations throughout the Monarch's summer breeding range. So we launched Regrow Milkweed for Monarchs in spring 2020 and invited community scientists like you to experiment with cutting back milkweed in a variety of locations and settings and with different tools and to report the findings. And our specific research questions were number one, Will regrowing milkweed stems contain more monarch eggs and caterpillars than older stems? Number two, are some methods or tools for cutting back milkweed more effective than others? And number three, does effectiveness depend on the location or context where a milkweed patch is growing? So we asked folks who helped with this study to find a patch of common milkweed, and they reported how many stems it had, the setting it was growing in, like lawn or garden or unmowed grass, etc. Um, and the landscape context of the study area, if it was in an urban area, suburban, agricultural, et cetera. Um, and we had posted instructions for this on the Regrow Milkweed for Monarchs website and on YouTube. So each patch was divided in half, and then each half was randomly uh, assigned to be cut back to five to 20 centimeters in height, or left alone as a control for comparison. And we allowed for quite a bit of flexibility in timing. So the cutting occurred throughout the summer, but generally from mid-June to mid-July. Then after cutting back milkweed, participants visited their milkweed patch every week or so for four or five weeks after the milkweed stem started to regrow. And they checked the stems for monarch eggs and caterpillars and then they uploaded their data. In total, we're sharing results from 160 milkweed patches. People originally registered about 520 patches. Um, and from this group, we narrowed the data set down to include just the patches where people followed up to submit weekly data, uh, patches that were within the Eastern Monarchs breeding range, um, and to uh, patches where monarchs actually visited and laid eggs. And about half of these milkweed patches were located in Michigan, but the other half were found across 19 other states and provinces. You'll remember that we asked people to use whatever tools they had available to them to cut back milkweed. And the graph on the left here shows that almost all the milkweed patches were cut back with hand tools like pruners or loppers, while a much smaller number, just 13, were cut back with motorized tools like string trimmers, lawn mowers, and so on. The figure in the middle shows that most of the milkweed patches were in suburban landscapes, uh, and the one on the right shows that they tended to be in people's lawns or gardens, although there were folks sending in data from farms, from restored prairies, and other places. So here's what we found, and we have to warn you, it's not totally straightforward. Overall, monarchs laid fewer eggs on the regrowing milkweed stems compared to the older control stems. That's a bit of a surprise, since it's opposite of what we found in our previous studies. By the way, if you're not familiar with how to read this graph, it's called a box plot. 
you can see the two treatments, regrown stems and the unmanipulated controls along the horizontal axis, and the density of monarchs on the vertical axis. The horizontal line in the middle of each box, the bold line, is the median value or 50th percentile. So half of the observations were larger than this number and half were smaller. The bottom and top of the box are the 25th and 75th percentiles. So from here, we're able to look at the data set in a lot more detail. So again, overall, regrowing milkweed stems did not increase the number of monarch eggs people found. But with the data set you all provided, we were able to do some additional digging and see if there are certain contexts where people found more or fewer monarch eggs. So first, let's take a look at the tools people used. And you'll remember that most people used hand tools like pruners and loppers. We can divide up the data set to look at what happened in this group versus those who used uh, motorized power tools. And it looks like there might be a difference. So hand tools resulted in people finding fewer monarchs, but when people used mowers, brush hogs, and other things, uh, the pattern is in the other direction. And it looks like there may have been more monarchs growing on regrowing stems in this treatment. We can't say for sure though, because this group had a very small sample size uh, and the difference isn't statistically significant, but it's a trend. Uh, so why might this have happened? We have some hypotheses that we would be excited to test in the future. So when people cut back milkweed stems with hand tools, they generally cut back individual stems and they leave the surrounding plants intact. And this could mean that regrowing milkweed stems are hidden under other vegetation, making them less accessible or appealing to monarchs. Uh, you'll also remember that our research suggested that regrowing stems are safer habitats because the disturbance removes uh, insect and spiders that could be predators. Uh, and it could be that by cutting back milkweed stems while leaving the rest of the habitat alone uh, leaves the predator community intact, meaning even if the same number of eggs are laid in the regrowing milkweed stems, they're more likely to be eaten. We're not sure about this, uh, but we think it's a really interesting possibility that we could study in the future. Next, there were also some differences depending on what sort of landscape the milkweed patch was in. So we saw negative effects of cutting when milkweed was growing in agricultural and suburban contexts, uh, but weakly positive ones when they were in more natural or urban settings. Uh, but these differences, again, weren't significant. Um, and from the data, we can't tell if the effect is really because of landscape context, or it could be due to some other underlying difference that is correlated with landscapes. So it didn't matter when people cut back their milkweed. That effect didn't really change throughout the season. However, the size of the milkweed patch does seem to be important. So we divided the milkweed patches into four equally sized groups um, based on how many stems they contained. And then we found that the negative effect of cutting back milkweed was strongest in the smallest patches, those with 22 or fewer stems, and there wasn't much of an effect in the larger patches. Um, and this could be because cutting back milkweed actually doesn't work as well in smaller patches, or it could be that there's some underlying effect that's correlated with patch size that we didn't measure. So where do we go from here? We definitely cannot make a blanket recommendation that people cut back milkweed in their backyards to help monarchs. It's just not that simple. However, there could be some context where it's a useful conservation tool. This research hints at, although not conclusively, that some methods of disturbance might be more effective than others, and that it might be important to disturb the vegetation surrounding milkweed stems as well as the milkweed itself. And this is a new research question that we're hoping to answer with future studies, um, and we couldn't make the, these discoveries without all of your help. Um, while we won't be running the Regrow project in 2021, if you're interested in continuing with this project, we'd encourage you to experiment on a small scale with different methods of cutting back milkweed, and maybe in some cases the plants around them. Although we know this isn't very practical, like in a garden setting. So we'd love to hear what you learn. And finally, we'd just like to say a huge thank you to everyone who was involved with this project, whether you submitted data or just followed along. Um, you helped us build this study into something much bigger than we could have done on our own. So thank you.